let's talk a bit today about the actual science behind a low carb, a high meat diet. Most of the stuff you see on social media is total nonsense. You're not gonna find any science about oatmeal being bad for you. You're not gonna find any science about lectin containing foods being bad for you. In fact, one of the foods most associated with longevity shown in a meta-analysis was in fact legumes, the highest lectin containing food. So uh, these things like plants are killing you, that kind of stuff, just, I mean, it's just such nonsense. Those people could be completely written off as idiots. It's just, they're, they're not scientific. But there are legitimate scientists that study keto diet. We're not talking carnivore diet, but keto diet. And they do have science behind them. I'm gonna tell you why that science is, is not accurate. Uh, but if you wanna know more about this, if you're watching this on Instagram, go to the YouTube link uh, in my bio. For those of you on YouTube, let's discuss. The first thing they kind of come up with is looking at multiple meta-analyses that show that saturated fat is not associated with heart disease. Well, we've always heard saturated fat causes heart disease. How could a study show that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease? And if that's true, then we shouldn't be telling people not to eat saturated fat. Uh, and in fact, there's a group of legitimate scientists trying to lobby the USDA to stop saying don't eat saturated food, uh, don't eat high saturated food. Now, these people are paid by uh, the beef industry. Most of their papers are funded by the beef industry. The one, uh, one author actually isn't and he refuses to get paid by the industry, Dr. Ludwig, and that's great. Uh, now, I will say that Dr. Ludwig has got a different kind of bias and that is He's biased because all of his research has been around low carb diet and uh, he's trying to prove a point and it would absolutely disrupt his entire life if his point was wrong. So what are some of the studies that they, they, they look at? Well, all of these studies have a critical flaw and this has been seen in the letters to the editor about these studies, but it really kind of started with a study done by Siri Torino and what they did is they did a meta-analysis and they showed that saturated fat wasn't associated with heart disease. But each of the studies in that meta-analysis controlled for cholesterol. What does that mean? Well, when you're doing a meta-analysis, like if you're trying to look if saturated fat causes heart disease, you wanna take out independent factors that could be confounders. In other words, independent factors that have an independent effect on heart disease. So for instance, you're gonna take out smoking because if you're looking at a group of people that are eating high saturated fat or eating so low saturated fat, if, they, if there are smokers in one of the groups, that's going to disrupt whether or not saturated fat causes heart disease. So you're gonna take out smokers, you're gonna take out people that are overweight, um, and so these factors are gonna be controlled for. Well, one of the factors they controlled for is high cholesterol. This is called over-adjustment bias. If you control for cholesterol, then you're eliminating the way that saturated fat causes heart disease. Because we know from ward studies, from, from feeding people saturated fat, that saturated fat causes a rise in LDL cholesterol in most people. And so if you're giving them uh, saturated fat, we see a definite rise. So we know that L saturated fat causes a rise in LDL, and then we know from multiple di different studies, we've got Cochrane reviews on it and stuff that, uh, that high LDL is associated with heart disease. So if you take a group of people out that don't, that have high cholesterol, you're basically eliminating the saturated fat effect. And now you can write a paper that says saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. And in fact, in one of the studies by Chowdhury uh, that got a lot of play in the British uh, Journal of Medicine, in their meta-analysis, some of the groups of people were actually on lipid-lowering drugs. So they're taking a statin, which lowers LDL cholesterol regardless of whether you're eating saturated fat. And so now it takes down your risk of heart disease. So these people are eating saturated fat and their cholesterol is being lowered by LDL cholesterol. And they're saying, uh, by by uh, a statin, and so they're making the statement that saturated fat doesn't cause heart disease. That's crazy. So the next real big idea that these scientists have had has been this idea, this is increased LDL cholesterol, 
on a low carb diet in adults with normal but not high body weight a meta analysis. And this was done by Dr. Les, uh, Ludwig's group. And what they wanted to show is when they looked at this group, they found that BMI uh, that was strongly inversely uh, related with LDL. In other words, a high BMI group, if they went on a low carb diet, tended not to rise their LDL, uh, raise their LDL very much. But there's a group, this is what they're trying to get at. There's a group of what they call hyper responders, healthy hyper responders, whose LDL cholesterol might soar when they go on a low carb diet. But the, implica imp the implication is that this isn't causing heart disease, that you can increase your LDL cholesterol without it causing a problem. And what they did is they looked at a, at a, a big group and they found that, yes, in fact, the people that weighed fairly normally when they went, and, and by the way, had normal, their, their point here is that these people have normal triglycerides, they have a high HDL, and yes, their LDL went up but people that were obese didn't. And part of their message here is if you're obese, you could do a low carb diet without worrying about it. Now that's a problem because in this study, you have people that were overweight that started this. So that's a problem because number one, they could be on medications like we talked about in the last study. And that may be confounding things. Number two, they probably weren't eating a very healthy diet to begin with. They were probably ready on a pretty high saturated fat because they're overweight to begin with. And we know uh, that you know, an unhealthy diet usually has high saturated fat. And so they may have already increased their cholesterol before they started this. Um, the other problem is that the overweight group, a large part of this meta-analysis that he did came from a study called the Diet Fit Study, which is a study done by Garner at, at Stanford. And in that study, the low-carb group was specifically told not to eat a high saturated fat. So they were effectively on a low-fat but high unsaturated fat diet. So it's unlikely that they were to get a rise in their cholesterol. And that really kind of messes up the meta-analysis because all that data, which is the bulk of the number of patients in this meta-analysis, is now in a group that is unlikely even eating high saturated fat. Um, and so that kind of makes this study a little bit worthless. But let's, let's talk a little bit about this group of what they call hyper responders. What they're trying to say is these, most of the people you see on social media, these gym rat type people that are eating a low carb diet, they've got abs and they're saying, look, look at these guys that have abs. They've got a lower triglyceride level, a higher HDL level. They are not at risk with their high LDL. And some of these people have like insanely high LDLs. And the statement, the thought process is they aren't going to get heart disease because they're so healthy otherwise. The idea is that an elevated LDL without any other metabolic problems is not an issue. Well, in order for, the, for that to be the case, we ought to have some kind of long-term look at people like this and believe it or not, we have that. The Cooper study, the Cooper study done in Dallas uh, by a buddy of mine, Dr. Amit Kara, they have looked at 30,000 people followed them for a mean 24 years. And what they did is they stratified people. Anybody in this group could not have elevated triglycerides, could not have any history of heart disease, could not smoke, could not have diabetes, could not have metabolic disease. They were basically healthy people. But they found that some people had a slightly elevated LDL cholesterol well. Some people had an LDL cholesterol above 160. And there was a 30% difference in cardiac mortality in this group over the mean 24 year follow-up. And most of that happened many years later. The other thing that they that, that these people like to look at is they looked at, um, they looked at a study out of Denmark where they found that they did a CT calcium scan score of the heart. And they found that people that had an elevated calcium score, like they had calcium uh, calcifications in the heart, with an elevated LDL cholesterol, they were definitely going to get heart disease. I mean, the, the risks were really high, but they found that people that didn't have calcium in their heart, if they had an elevated LDL cholesterol, they were unlikely to get heart disease. Okay, so the problem with that study is a cross-sectional study. They didn't follow people for many years. The second problem with that study is the group that didn't have calcifications, average age was 50. The group that had calcification, 
calcification is the average age of 62. And so the implication here, if you look at the Cooper study, in the first 10 to 15 years, there's not a lot of difference. But as time goes on, the group with the higher cholesterol starts ramping up in their amount of heart disease. You can't follow someone for a short period of time and make an assessment. You certainly can't do a cross-sectional study. And in the Denmark study, when you look at it, it's very possible that those 52-year-olds had early plaque that's not going to show up on a calcification score. But over time, that early plaque, we know from, from autopsy studies of kids that heart disease studies, heart disease starts many, many years before we actually see it. It starts when kids are young with these little atheromatous plaques that aren't going to show up on a calcium scan, but will eventually start to calcify much later. And we also know, by the way, they they looked at this one trial called the MESA trial, that about 30% of people with a normal calcium scan ended up having a heart attack. And that may be because that, just because the plaque isn't calcified yet, it could still rupture and cause a heart attack. And so having a negative calcium score does not mean you're not going to get a heart attack. So this argues against that, but the best thing in the world, if we're really going to make an argument, it would be a randomized controlled trial. Like, I wish we could take a kid at birth and have one with high cholesterol and one with low cholesterol and follow them through their life. That would be the perfect randomized controlled trial to see if there was a difference in heart disease. Guess what? We can do that because of something called Mendelian randomization. And what these studies have done, they've looked at specific genetic markers that predispose someone to high cholesterol and followed those people over many years versus people that were predisposed by their genetics to have low cholesterol. You know, there's some people out there, they could eat as much fat as they want and they continue to have low cholesterol. And what they found is there's no question that having a high LDL cholesterol over a course of a lifetime predisposes you to early cardiac death and having a low cholesterol, low LDL cholesterol protects you. And then the scientists try to go into this idea that these healthy responders have large, fluffy LDL, that, that it's not the small, tight LDL, it's a large, fluffy LDL, and therefore they're less likely to get sick because large LDL somehow isn't associated with heart disease. It is associated with heart disease. That is not true. And in fact, in these Mendelian randomization trials, the people that are more predisposed to having high LDL cholesterol actually have high, large LDL cholesterol, not the small type. And they still end up having more heart disease. And in fact, we know from saturated fat studies where we give people saturated fat, it is in fact a rise in the large LDL that we see with this increase in saturated fat. So while the low carb group have studies these studies are fairly weak. They, they also go into things like, they're like, okay, well, let's, let, if this all, if we can't go on the LDL, let's go on the inflammation. Meat doesn't cause inflammation. And they'll, they'll present studies showing, there's like this one study they love to talk about called the Untargeted Metabolomic Analysis Investigating Links Between Unprocessed Meat and Markers of Inflammation. In the study, C-reactive protein, which is one of the main factors we look at, was associated with inflammation. They don't talk about that in there. IL-6 and TNF were, were decreased. Now there's other studies that have been done that have actually shown a relationship between um, meat and inflammation, but they don't tell you about that. Those studies, they just tell you about the study they want you to look at. Now, there's kind of a problem when looking with inflammation because we usually look at inflammation in a fasting state. You know, you go, your doctor tells you to go and get labs. They tell you to get it fasting. They check C-reactor protein, but you're fasting. Now, interestingly, Ludwig, who I talked about before, did one low-carb study, and he was trying to look at whether low-carb increases metabolism. But the low-carb group actually had an elevated C-reactor protein, and they had an elevated cortisol in their urine. Uh, now, interestingly, in his subsequent low-carb uh, trials, he no longer looked at cortisol in the urine or C-reactor protein. Keep that in mind. But what happens when we look at a study after eating? What does saturated fat do to things like P-select and other markers of inflammation? Well, it increases it more than carbs do, more than monounsaturated fat more than polyunsaturated fat. This was in a trial where they fed people muffins and the muffins had saturated fat or monounsaturated fat or polyunsaturated fat or low fat. Uh, 
And so the person's eating a muffin, they don't know what they're eating, but we could see a, def a definitive change in the amount of inflammation. And in fact, when you look at a trial where they gave people so it was interesting. They gave people sugar water. They gave them water, no inflammation. They gave them sugar water. And yes, sugar water did increase inflammation slightly because any kind of food is going to give us a little bit of inflammation because our body develops reactive oxygen species when we're dealing with that sugar. They then gave them orange juice. Now, orange juice blunted that because orange juice has basically antioxidants that blunt the inflammatory response. Then they gave them cream. Cream shot, shot the inflammatory markers up. That's because cream has multiple ways it increases inflammation. Maybe this is endotoxin, maybe it's saturated fat causing uh, gap junction um, opening so that endotoxins can get uh, into the system. Uh, there, there's multiple ways that it could do it, but the bottom line is it increased inflammation dramatically. Um, but these kind of studies aren't talked about. And then they'll go into, you know, they'll talk about studies looking at, for instance, uh, red meat consumption and all-cause mortality and uh, meta-analysis. And what I want to say is that red meat might not be associated with heart disease, or specifically on processed meat. You can't make, a, you cannot make an argument with processed meat, all right? Bacon, processed meat is always associated in just about every study done with um, mortality, whether it's all-cause mortality, cancer, cardiac mortality, diabetes, processed meat is always up there. Unprocessed meat is also likewise there, uh, but maybe to a little bit of a lesser extent. And when you look at this study done by Larson, you'll see that with unprocessed meat, most of it led to a higher all-cause mortality, uh, so that there was a slight increase in all-cause mortality much higher with processed meat. You can see all the studies showed with with unprocessed meat showed an increased risk and certainly total meat showed an increased risk of all-cause mortality. But it was a little less associated with unprocessed meat. Well, there was an outlier, right? There was a big outlier. And that's why I like to look at forest plots because forest plots will tell you that had this outlier not been there, this would have been a much stronger relation. So what happens in this outlier? Well, there's differences. When you look around the world, if you look at um, Asia, they, they, the, you see much less unprocessed, uh, much less processed meat, uh, much more unprocessed meat, but yet a lot, a lot less meat in general. Uh, their meat may be different. There's multiple reasons that that can be. Uh, but it's interesting that there's an outlier that messes up that meta-analysis, another thing they're not going to tell you. So there is science behind a low-carb diet, but that science has a lot of flaws in it. And if you're looking at inflammation in a plant-based diet, there's many studies. I don't know of a single study that shows that plant-based diets don't decrease inflammation. Uh, there's many studies showing an improvement in long-term mortality, all-cause mortality, uh, cardiac mortality with plant-based diets. Uh, so while there may be some data showing that a keto diet can lower your risk of heart disease, I'm sorry, that could lower your uh, your diet, your weight and could then possibly by lowering your weight have an effect on heart disease, it doesn't bear out in the actual research. And just because there's science doesn't mean that science is correct.